Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our weekly Facebook uh, discussion and Q&A. Um, this Q&A is brought to you by Vector Ecole Teleneurology. It's another beautiful uh, Thursday evening in the south of England, um, and we are very lucky tonight to have uh, an excellent neurologist and surgeon, Colin Driver. If you're not familiar with the format of this uh, live Q&A, um, Simon and I, we invite every week an expert in the field of neurology. Um, we put to that expert a number of questions that we selected in advance, um, and Simon uh, will share that, that part of the discussion. And at the end of that Q&A, which will last about 25, 30 minutes, um, I will take questions that you've submitted in the comment box. So feel free during the presentation to put your question and I will select them to then put to our guest tonight. As I say, we're very lucky tonight. We've got um, a young neurologist, I mean young for Simon for sure, um, not as young for me. Um, you will notice that tonight Simon has put his best white coat and I've always seen this coat very white. I've never seen a hair or a little bit of blood on it. But he's very <laughs> proud, he's very proud of it. So. Um, I think he should be applauded for that. Um, we've got Colin. Colin is a good old friend of us. Um, he is a clinical director at Lumbry Park Veterinary Specialist, which is in the south of England. He's also a diplomat of the European College of Veterinary Neurology. And Colin is going to talk to us about thoracolumbar myelopathy in pugs dogs. So if you like um, neuroimaging, especially spinal neuroimaging, or if you like neurosurgery, you're in for a treat because Colin is going to cover all that, um, especially in the pugs. Um, that leads me to pass the mic for to Simon for him to give me a few abuse and then ask a few questions to Colin um, about the topic of pug myelopathy. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks very much. No, no, no abuse to you, Laurent. Like I, it's it's pure envy. Um, I put this on for you to just try and remember back to the days when you used to be a clinician. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just just remember those those days, animals, that sort of stuff. I miss uh, them so much. <laughs> I miss it so much. You can't imagine. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Colin, for coming on. Um, we've got, it's kind of got, awkward to join in your banter here. <laughs> yeah, well, it can get worse because Laurent is on non-alcoholic beer. He's the only guy I've seen to actually get wasted on it like halfway through. But <laughs> we'll, we'll see how we'll see how we go. He's the only um, man who can get wasted on zero percent alcohol. Yeah. That's, that's it. Lo loosed. Let's go loosely with the word man here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's good to be a good night. <laughs> yeah, my volume of distribution is a bit higher than yours, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no. All right, let's get started with um, a great first question. Great yeah. first question coming right at you. Ed. What is the big deal with bugs? Yeah, absolutely. So. When uh, Lauren asked me for a title for the presentation, um, this one popped into my head, and, and I, I guess your viewers might be thinking, "What is the you know really the big deal with pugs? Why is it that we'd be so interested in them?" Um, and, it, and it really is just because um, they have a couple of interesting spinal cord diseases, but also because they're relatively more popular than they used to be. Um, as you can see from this picture on either side top left and right they're, they're obviously very cute dogs and they feature quite heavily in uh, marketing of various things like movies here as you can see frank from men in black um, and they're also quite a bit more popular than they used to be um, if you look at um, the data i've got there in the table it's from kennel club registrations in the uk and um, that's obviously it'd be interesting to know uh, what it is for the current year but pugs of, of um, and french bulldogs have popped into that top five on that list there so they're definitely more common and they classify as one of these dog breeds that um, has a screw shaped tail and it's the association with that that might influence some of the conditions that they get um, so really that's it okay well that's a good a good introduction um i, I you're the first person um that's had to answer why are you here uh, <laughs> <laughs> Who <is this> guy? <laughs> so, so good 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 recovery there um second question then is is uh, what are the, what myelopathies are common in pugs um so just like a lot of dogs um uh, they they definitely do develop intervertebral disc disease and uh typically those are chronic fibroid protrusions um 
they can get extrusions. I mean, it, you know, it's not impossible, but I have a, a sort of gut feeling that a lot of uh, extrusions, they, um, you know, the extrusions are relatively rare and a lot of MRIs are perhaps misdiagnosed extrusions that were actually protrusions. Um, so that, that is possible, but they also um, can develop a quite nasty progressive uh, kyphoscoliosis, so arching and curvature of the spine, and those are caused by malformations of vertebral bodies. Um, and then the last two category here, categories here are uh, diseases actually that develop within the lining of the spinal cord itself, so within the dura. The first uh, SAD or subarachnoid diverticular is a sort of blind ending pocket within the lining of the um, meninges that causes fluid to build up and, and start to compress the spinal cord itself um, as a form of intradural spinal compression. And the last one is a um, condition that we've really only been describing in the last seven, eight years and now increasingly is, is getting characterized better, which is this so-called constrictive myelopathy, but um, also goes under the name of pug dog myelopathy, um, especially amongst um, breeders and, and those that are, um, are keen on the breed. Um, so it, it, it's these four big ones, really. And, and obviously, we know quite a lot about this disease already in other breeds. And, and that's not really what I wanted to talk about. I really wanted to focus on the second and fourth of these, I suppose, because those are ones that are relatively unusual and, and um, relatively unique to the pug. We do see them very occasionally in other breeds as well. But, um, you know, those are particularly interesting for the pug. So um, how clinically, if possible, um, can you differentiate all of those uh, diagnoses? Yeah, it can be a, a real challenge. Um, the first thing to say is very obviously it's got a bimodal distribution and age. So you're not going to see um, clinically relevant vertebral body malformations causing kyphosis and myelopathy in dogs typically they're older than a year um, we would most often see them develop signs as early as three four months of age and um, it'd be clinically relevant by the time they're seven eight months to a year uh, and that's for the kyphoscoliosis uh, whereas the other conditions come on much later on in life typically somewhere in the seven ten years um often you know, medium for that's normally about nine um, but otherwise, it can be very difficult. They, they're all causes of, of chronic and um, progressive uh, spinal cord signs, so paresis and ataxia, uh, and typically they're non-painful. Um, one thing, though, is, is the presence of urinary and, and fecal incontinence, which is very common in dogs that have um, arachnoid diverticular or constrictive myelopathy, and that's because as um, intradural diseases, they're much more likely to involve the dorsal part of the spinal cord, and that is conveying information, sensory information, um, through the spinothalamic tracts up to the brain, and um, some of that is for sensory thresholds for distension in the terminal colon and rectum and so these animals often will distend with feces uh, in the terminal colon which gets very dry and then it drops out as if um, pooing without knowing it basically and uh, that's much more um, common in those diseases than it is with this disease for example so if you're seeing a middle-aged pug that's dropping poo as it walks in the house I'd be much more worried about one of those diagnoses Excellent. All right. And what diagnostic tests um, then um, do you use or how do you use your diagnostic tests to separate them out if clinically it's a bit tough? Um, so it all comes down to diagnostic imaging, really. Um, and it doesn't have to be cross-sectional imaging for all of these. Um, so these are plain film x-rays um, of, of two different uh, cases, obviously. Uh, the first on the left there, you're seeing a... Um, a dog with quite severe curvature um, in the sagittal plane, this, this uh, scoliosis there. Um, and that is more often a cause of clinical sign in people. Um, and it is essentially because our rib cages can incarcerate our abdominal organs if we're twisted to the side. It, obviously, it's quite disfiguring and debilitating for us because we're bipedal. Um, but for a dog, interestingly, those are much less relevant, and uh, that's on the next slide. But what you can see on the right there is a kyphosis, so that's this arching 
uh, of, of the spine because one of the vertebrae is uh, essentially wedge shaped and, and because it's um, uh, missing at the bottom we call them dorsal hemivertebra so the diagnosis on the right there is the one that we're interested in which is kyphosis secondary to dorsal hemivertebra and uh, cross-sectional imaging uh, you know, here two examples from CT um, can be very uh, useful, especially if you want to determine clinical relevance. You, you can do it from the x-ray, of course, as well. But what I've given you here is a little bit of data on the significance of the angle of, of curvature. And we call it the Cobb angle. And it's measured from where that malformed spinal segment is starting and finishing. And um, there's a study I've, I've included the data from here that essentially suggests that if that angle is over 35, it's often associated with clinical signs. And as I mentioned, scoliosis is much less of an issue for, for dogs than it is for, for people. And when it comes to the other diagnoses, um, really, you need imaging, cross-sectional imaging that can give you um, the appearance of the arachnoid space and you want to know much more about what's happening to the parenchyma and the spinal cord and MRI is much better for that obviously. Uh, and these were some findings that we uh, published last year in a group of pug dogs that had uh, you know what you could describe as adult onset thracolumbar myelopathy. Um, typically nine-year-old dogs with chronic signs somewhere in the region of five months and, and um, half uh, fecally or urinary incontinent. And when you look at this group of dogs, um, about half of them have disc disease, um, but the other half will have um, um, intra-dural uh, disease. So they'll either have arachnoid diverticular or constrictive myelopathy, which is a cross-section of patients that are, you know, middle-aged myelopathic patients is, is, is extremely high. And it might even be that some of those disc disease cases we've classified wrong because some dogs might get disc protrusions for the same fundamental underlying causes as those other diseases. And uh, interestingly, in one study, as, in one case in the study as well, we had a dog that had some scarring and probably malacia within the spinal cord, but without any evidence for compression outside or within the spinal cord. And um, we wonder you know, if it's possible for dogs to have a wobbler type disease where you've got a dynamic changing of the supporting structures of the vertebral column. So with movement, you actually get protrusion of the disc that um, causes a recurrent uh, injury to the spinal cord. Uh, so if we move on, we've got some examples of this <clears throat> that are lifted out of our study. So, so if you want to take a look at that, um, that would be useful. But on the, on the top row there, you've, you've got an example of this where you've got um, degeneration and some protrusion of a disc with a focal um, region of abnormality in the spinal cord that probably represents a combination of inflammation, edema, and gliosis. Um, and what the arrow is highlighting is, is this sort of bilobed, V-shaped, extradural protrusion of, of, of the annulus of that disc. But really the degree of, of extradural spinal cord compression is mild compared to how bad the spinal lesion is. And then on the bottom row, um, if you split it again into two rows, that, so the middle row is what we would all typically accept as being an arachnoid diverticular, where you've got this single focal dilatation of the arachnoid space. And on the bottom row, <clears throat> you've got a more complex situation. And if you look at image B, there's three little arrows, hopefully you can see them. And those are delineating linear hypo intensities within the arachnoid space. And we believe that these are fibrous bands that are essentially um, constricting and, and tethering the spinal cord. And if you look at the, um, uh, the dorsal reconstruction image D at so the bottom right, what you can see effectively is that sort of pinching um, from either side onto the intradural uh, parenchyma of the spinal cord. And so we felt that this was best matching the sort of classic description of constrictive myelopathy, which is essentially a, 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 a fibrosis within the arachnoid space. Excellent. Um, and and <clears throat> one of the really interesting things about this disease is there's a very um, frequent association with dysplasia, so malformation of the articular processes. So stability in the vertebral column dorsally is provided by um, the lamina of the vertebra, the interarchuate ligaments and also supporting joints that fit like this. 
So you've got the uh, cranial and the caudal articular processes. And, and in the lumbar spine, those are really useful for rotational stability. Um, what pugs very often lack is the caudal processes. Um, it, it's a common finding in, in lots of small breed dogs. So we're, we're never certain if it's actually linked to the uh, cause of these diseases, but there is very, very often association between their presence and the development of fibrosis within the arachnoid space. So what I'm highlighting in the top image there, the, the, the arrow head is a completely aplastic process and the, um, the arrow is a hyperplastic process. Uh, in number two, you've got one abnormal and one normal joint and the disease has occurred at the level where you've got bilateral disease of those joints. And then to further highlight the, the um, suggestion that the absence of those joints could cause instability, um, this dog in the bottom example has got quite a uh, quite marked step in the vertebral column where that little arrow is. And this is something that we would call spondylolisthesis. So you've got this aesthetic spine as a result of an absence, or we would believe an absence of, of, of those normal joints. Okay, thank you very much for that. That um, we understand a lot, a lot of what uh, is evolving currently with the, this disease. But the big question then is: is how do you do you treat? We got a kind of two part question. How do you treat the dorsal hemivertebra part of this? Yeah, so um, I just summarise the, the literature. Really, I mean, it, it does seem to be a surgical uh, surgical disease, and, and colleagues uh, have looked into non surgical management in a, in a group of dogs, and essentially found that. Typically, the disease is progressive and, and, and young animals that are unfortunately developing the progressive paraparesis as a result of that problem uh, might need euthanasia if, if surgery doesn't become an option for them. Uh, and we also know that decompressing the spine alone, so a continuous dorsal laminectomy over the area where there's cord compression, um, results in a relatively poor outcome, either early post-operative deterioration or failure to improve with time. Um, and it might be because partly uh, the cord compression is more of a tethering. Uh, the cord is tethered by its nerve roots down a little bit like uh, the guy ropes on a tent. So lifting the roof off the bone over the top of the spinal cord may achieve very little. Um, and what we typically accept is, is stabilization is helpful. And, it, and it's probably because these young dogs do millions of movements. If I take a bit of paper, it's actually a credit card bill. I'll forward it to you, Laurent. Um, uh, the, the, the we'll, we'll are... freeze it and magnify the numbers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the vertebral column is, is, is probably sort of recurrently bending like this and, and it's damaging the spinal cord. So um, most most uh, people now would, would feel that stabilization, vertebral stabilization is, is necessary for that and typically in a segmental fashion. So so before, mid and after those those malformations. Um, what's more contentious is to, is to how that's achieved, whether it's achieved through the chest or from dorsal approach or and uh, also whether or not it's necessary to realign the vertebra uh, because in children with the severe scoliosis what they will actually do is a vertebrectomy they'll remove the offending vertebra and really attempt to realign you um, but where that uh, cosmetic um, outcome isn't really necessary for our patients um, it's not really clear whether or not we need to realign the spine um, and then you know there's a list of studies that outline ways you can do this pins and screws and bone cement you can go in through an intercostal approach and, pray, and place plates or, again, screws and cements on the side of the vertebral column. Um, and it's quite common to use um, 3D printing technologies for this purpose. So I've got my box of bones here, which is my uh, a list of, of patients that I've, I've had in the past. Um, here that I've all got 3D prints for. And these can be very helpful for uh, manipulating in the surgery to understand um, where um, how the vertebrae are malformed and aligned. Um, but the other thing that we see people use these days is, is um, actual drill guides to, to place uh, implants more accurately into the vertebral bodies, because in dogs you have to do that through the pedicles. <clears throat> um, and probably the one study that uh, is most extensive on this topic is, is Marios's paper from 2015 about uh, this group of dogs and uh, the outcome is described as satisfactory for, for the majority of dogs that had a segmental stabilization with or without decompression. 
Nice. Um, well, just to clarify for the general public that are watching, when you say you've got a box of bones of your previous patients, yeah. not really <laughs> plastic printed things yeah. of bones, that bones. Not <laughs> just, just made that clear. Yeah. Um, you made that clear. Okay. Because most of your patients we all get out of there, they walk, they do great. So, yes. yeah. um, so uh, the second part to this question is how do you treat cons the constrictive part, the constrictive myelopathy? Yeah, so um, it, it's uh, um, uh, totally uh, different, obviously, because we need to try and deal with this intradural uh, compression of the cord. And this is uh, um, uh, data from a study that my colleague Anna Taro um, uh, published um, last year, again, looking at a group of pugs. Um, obviously, they're quite a heterogeneous disease population, so it's difficult to do large studies on one element of the pathology. But in, in this study, we had 14 dogs, um, and uh, typically they had six months of, of paresis um, and or incontinence before we, see, before we saw them. And uh, typically, we would stabilise the vertebra, um, and then we would do various decompressive techniques. So if we felt that uh, disc disease and ventral extradural compression was the main issue, we would deal with that through um, something like a partial lateral corpectomy. Um, if we felt that they had uh, fibrosis within the uh, dura, we would do uh, a laminectomy to get to the cord, and then we would do a durotomy to open the dura and we would resect what was in there, so a partial durectomy, and then replace it with something synthetic, so a duroplasty. Um, and what we found was that we had a good, reasonably good outcome in 80% of cases, so half of them would improve and another 30% would stabilize for the period of the study. Um, but obviously we, we lack long-term data on this, so what we you know, would love to do is follow these cases up a little bit further and get two, three, four years down the line and find out whether that uh, improvement is sustained. The cases that didn't do too well would typically just have extremely chronic signs before presentation. So uh, I can think of one dog from the study that had urinary incontinence for 12, 18 months before it presented to us. And uh, part of the obviously subjective uh, attempt at um, developing uh, objective data for a study like this is, is a pet owner's perception of their pet's outcome might be influenced by failure to resolve one of the problems they came in for, of course. So, it, yeah, like I said, it's a very heterogeneous population of dogs. So you have to take this kind of information with a bit of a <clears throat> with a bit of a view on that. Okay, and I suppose the big question is really um, leading on from that is. What do you think the cause uh, of this constrictive myelopathy is? Yeah, so, oh, and uh, I, I, I'd love to answer your question, uh, Simon. Should, should we do this first, Laurent, and then come back to the question? Or yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I just um, included a few um, magnified images from our, from our surgery, just so you viewers can get a rough idea of what I'm talking about there. So on the left there, you can see a, a dorsal laminectomy to expose the cord and the dura has been um, open with the stay suture there and what the tip of those forceps there is highlighting is is the sort of uh, mesh of uh, fibrous tissue that's um, within the dura and it appears to be um, circumferentially um, constricting or compressing the, the cord parenchyma and so what we're doing is using fine instruments or even the tip of a needle sometimes just to try and reset that from the overlying cord. And you can see on the right there, we've resected that off in a sort of plaque uh, so that we've got it reflected away. And, and, our, and our aim with that, whilst we think that it might be impossible to completely resect all the adhesions, is to, is to um, untether the cord as much as we can. Because every time your heart beats, your nervous system beats with it. And part of the pathology for this disease might be that that beating is prevented uh, by this scar tissue. And then when we've done that, on the next slide, you can see we'll place some implants into the vertebral body. Uh, that's either gonna be threaded pins or screws, um, and uh, they're quite off to the side of the image uh, because of the fact that we're going into the body because it's probably chordal to T11. And um, we've enshrouded them in bone cement, so I'll, I'll use whatever I've got to hand to, to mold it into a, a, a little cube. Um, and the reason why we do that is it's obviously very contentious. We talked about the, the articular process dysplasia and the possibility of, it, possibility of instability. 
Um, but the fact is, we're going to worsen the situation by doing a dorsal laminectomy. So we're going to remove the lamina and the interarcuate ligament. So we're not going to improve stability. So our feeling is, is augmenting that state, uh, that those stabilizing structures is probably a reasonable thing to do. Whether it's involved in the cause of the disease or not, we're, we're not sure. Um, so, and, and I quite often at that level would do it unilaterally because when you've got that much open cord exposed, it, it's quite a lot of dead space to close over. And, and we found that any early post-operative deterioration we would have in these dogs would often be associated with bilateral stabilization. We're trying to get two implants in each vertebra, but cordal to T11, it's normally possible to do that unilaterally. Um, and we're not creating too much scoliosis because it's only one segment that we're operating on. Um, and then on the right image there, you can see we've, we've um, done a form of duroplasty. So in people, they would suture the dura back together, but canine dura, in pugs at least, hold the suture very poorly. So we will, um, some, especially when you've done a, a, a durectomy and you've got a larger defect than, than you had when you came in. So that, that product there is a, a xenograft. It's a bit of pig intestine shaving, essentially. Um, this is a connective tissue xenograft that goes on to, to cover the dura, so a form of duroplasty effectively. Um, but in answer to your question, Simon, um, what causes this disease? Um, there's been a bit more work done on this, and this is the sort of current seminal paper on, on um, the pathogenesis of, of the disease, because this is a large uh, histology uh, study um, with post-mortem examination of, of dogs that have had the disease. And it's, uh, as I suggested, it's characterized by circumferential um, fibrosis uh, of, of, of the uh, pia arachnoid fibrosis and focally at that level damage and loss of tissue, so malacia. And interestingly, um, their population of dogs in this study was, uh, again, as you'd expect, quite heterogeneous. And some of them had uh, appeared to be an inflammatory phase, so they would have a lymphohistocytic inflammatory picture on histology, and some of them would just have fibrosis. So it's possible that we're, we're um, identifying animals at different stages of the development of the pathology. And uh, interestingly, in people, there is a, a, a familial form of uh, adhesive arachnoiditis, they call it, reported. So the interesting thing about pugs um, is whether or not this disease um, is caused by a familial tendency to respond to inflammation within the dura with the development of fibrous scar tissue. Uh, and that's uh, an interesting thing because cap dysplasia, so caudal articular process dysplasia is quite common in small breed dogs, but we don't tend to see this disease in other breeds. Uh, I'm, we were having this discussion earlier on this week, me and Ron, and we've had a case this week in our clinic that was Westie. Um, and we've, uh, I think I've probably seen a Jack Russell with it in the past as well. So it is super rare. Um, but uh, it does very often develop in relationship with, with the cat dysplasia. So simply the prevalence of the two problems being associated would, would suggest they share uh, an etiology, but we just don't know. So constrictive myelopathy, we use as the name for the disease, but probably we should be referring to it as a familial thoracolumbar um, arachnoid fibrosis. Great. All right. Well, that is the, the end of these questions for you. Um, thank you very much for, for illuminating the uh, uh, current understanding of, of this area. Um, and I'm going to pass you back to Laurent, who will probably have some questions from, from the audience. So we've got um, the, um, one question from Anne. Um, I presume Anne refer to the uh, constrictive uh, myelopathy. Um, rather than the other pathology. I mean, do you always perform a CT after the MRI to look for the, you know, the absence of um, articular facet? So I think, I think it depends ultimately on the spatial resolution of your MRI images, because I don't think it's absolutely necessary to perform CT after MRI in these cases. Uh, we often do. Um, and I find it's helpful because it's very difficult, uh, perhaps it's just our scanner, but it can be very difficult to, to determine whether articular process is a dysplastic or aplastic. And, uh, you know, it kind of leads to the question of 
if they are at adjacent segments, what do you do about it? Should you include them in your segmental stabilization or is it going to influence the development of disease at those levels? And it's a question that I don't know the answer to, unfortunately. Um, it'd be very interesting to obviously follow a lot of these dogs for a long time period, but my, my gut feeling is to keep it simple and, and focal so that you're not changing spinal biomechanics too much. Um, but yeah, it, it's not always obvious on x-ray. Um, and it's not always obvious on MRI, but it, you know, if, you, if you're extremely confident in the resolution of your MRI images and perhaps you're using thin slice T1s or, or um, you're using gradient echo sequences, for example, you might get a, a better picture of, of the individual articular processes and be able to plan your surgery on that basis. So if you have any more questions, just feel free to post it. In the meantime, I'm going to ask a couple of questions to Colin. Um, from a diagnostic imaging, what kind of sequence would you recommend for people having MRI to investigate this uh, PUG, especially the constrictive myelopathy? Um, so um, there is, uh, beyond the normal um, turbo spin echo sequences that we do in MRI, there is one sequence that's useful, um, which is a, um, a thin slice sequence that's a form of rap rapidly acquired gradient echo sequence um, on semen scanners. This has got a CIS, um, constructive interference in steady state imaging. Um, it's a type of MRI technology that's used to image um, uh, small uh, nerves like uh, cranial nerves in people, for example. I think they use it for acoustic neuromas. Um, but it's a volumetric sequence, so you can look at it in 3D. Um, and its purpose that is to highlight small structures that are surrounded by cerebrospinal fluid. Um, so for that reason, it's really good for actually trying to identify these little struts and strands in the arachnoid space. And uh, that, again, might be very helpful for two reasons. I think first, for to plan the surgery, and secondly, prognosis, because um, I've certainly seen a couple of these cases where I've had to say to the pet owner, there's so many circumferential adhesions. I think the prognosis even with surgery is likely to be regarded. Okay. Um, the other question I will have for you, um, I think there was another one. Um, in terms of, um, I have to remember now, um, for the pugs with arachnoid diverticulae and constrictive myelopathy, since they all occur at the same region, are we talking about the same disease, but a different evolution of the disease potentially? Yeah, it's a, it's a really, uh, really good question. I mean, well, I think, um, if, you know, if you've operated on a, um, what is very clearly a congenital SAD, especially if you're in the sort of C23 region of a Rottweiler, um, for, you know, it's a classic age and breed for a, for a dog to have an SAD. Um, what you really find in the arachnoid space are more webs, you, you know, that's how they might describe them in people. Uh, and those webs are very fine and friable and, uh, and they're very easy to break down um, using uh, um, the, the types of probe that we use in neurosurgery. And, uh, you know, the surgery typically is a lot more straightforward, at least. Um, whereas I think a lot of dogs who... Um, in the past, uh, described as having a thracolumbar SAD um, in a middle age life, you know, again, a Westie is, is a classic breed that might be affected with that type of disease. Often, those webs or adhesions are a lot thicker, a lot harder to remove, a lot more um, vascular. Mm -hmm. um, I think that yes, it's, it's possible that SAD is a is a is a different development, perhaps it's a, um, a more rapid response to, to, to the inflammation, or perhaps it's just that fiber, you know, the fibrous band forms very quickly, it just manages to get CSF to accumulate. Um, you know, they're, they're much more satisfying cases to operate on because you know that by uh, alleviating that buildup of fluid, you're gonna have such a positive outcome for the patient um, relative to where you are likely to find fibrosis immediately under the dura. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting, and another thing that we talk about in neuroimaging sometimes is the concept of a multi-lobulated SAD. Um, so that image I showed you earlier where there was a cord with three little struts around it. I think, you know, you might 
have a radiologist report that as a as a multi-lobulated SAD, and by definition, you know that's not the wrong thing. Uh, I, if you look at the one of the pathology slides from that paper I had at the end there, um, they show a cross section uh, in histology of of essentially that multi-lobulated pockets of, of accumulated CSF. So, you know, it's a spectrum. Uh, I, I don't know if it relates to uh, the rate of development or the, the change between inflammation and fibrosis or, or some other factor. Um, there is a couple more questions for you. How often do you see consecutive myelopathy in puppy? Basically, you know, how young have you seen that condition? Um, I, the youngest I would seen it is six, seven years of age. Um, I've never been convinced of that diagnosis in a, in a puppy. Um, if I were to see a, a, a pug of that age with compatible signs, I would be thinking um, malformation. Um, the earliest I've uh, diagnosed and operated a, hem a dorsal hemiversidra was four months in a pug, um, but I would, you know, within a few weeks of life, essentially, they could start developing clinical signs. Mm -hmm. But there would be other differentials, of course. You know, there there would be yeah. infectious causes uh, for myelopathy in dogs of those age uh, of that age would be a particular concern as well. To so take a message, most likely something else than that. I'd be saying. Yeah. Um, last one. Um, have you ever used submeningeal shunt tube placement technique um, in constructive, I presume, myelopathy? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's a yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and what the question is referring to is a surgical study that used, um, I, I think it might have been uh, a lacrimal duct flushing tube. Uh, you guys might be able to correct me, but um, essentially, um, it, if it's too traumatic and it's too difficult or impossible to remove that uh, constrictive uh, fibrous tissue, should you simply put something in the within the dura to allow fluid to bypass the blockage. Um, and I think that for some cases that would probably work. My concern would be, uh, as I said, part of the pathology might be related to this tethering and preventing the normal elastic recoil of the nervous system. So if you're, if you're using that technique, it might not address that. Um, and I'd have to re-examine the specifics of that study, but I think there were a small number of bugs in it that were some of the cases that had a less good outcome, if you like. Um, so um, it's, it's a really it's a really good point. And uh, no, uh, it's not a technique that I use. Good, good. I think we have to draw it to a close. Um, before we finish, I just wanted to let you know what we've got um, in store for the next couple of weeks. Next week, we we'll try to do a double act. We'll um, do something very clinical. Um, I will present with John Ines, who is an orthopedic uh, specialist, uh, the approach to forelimb lameness or paresis. How do you know if it's ortho or neuro? What kind of clinical cl clue you try to collect you know, on your examination? What kind of diagnostic test will you perform that may guide you? Um, and what, is the, the, what are the common differential in this condition for both neuro and orthopedic disease? And in two weeks' time, we've got a really interesting presentation. Uh, by Fred Winninger uh, about 3D printing in neurosurgery. So very useful um, in line with what um, Colin was discussing today with the surgical correction of this MI vertebrae. Thank you very much, Colin, for um, giving us your time. I know you quite have a busy family life with two young children, so I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. oh, yeah. Thank you very much. And Are you so Join us um, to give a, a round of virtual applause um, for Colleen. Thank you very much. And I hope you all have a, a great evening and we we'll see you again next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.